If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site, which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal, which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentinterview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. Grinner, when did you first become interested in aviation? Uh, it was the fault of my dad actually when I was a young kid. I was six years old and uh, my dad started building model aeroplanes for me. He had served in the RAF in the 1950s doing national service and uh, he'd worked on the Meteor and the Vampire um, and the Venom I believe as well. But it, those, those were the first two models that he made for me, the FX Meteor and the FX Vampire. Um, and he took me to a few air shows and the bug just hit me. I just loved the, uh, the raw power and sound uh, and of course the, the aeroplane that caught my attention, believe it or not, was actually the Lightning. Uh, and I remember being at an air show, I think it was around about 1973, so I'd have been eight years old, and uh, the Lightning display got airborne. Uh, it was RF Leckenfield actually that particular year and uh, I watched the Lightning getting airborne do a rotation takeoff and I remember after the noise subsided turning around to my dad and going, Dad, that's what I want to do when I grow up. So that was it. And that was it. <laughs> uh, and, th and the bug, bug stuck with me all the way through my childhood. And uh, in all honesty, I was pretty single-minded all the way through. You know, going to, into the Air Force and being a fighter pilot was all I wanted to do. I wasn't interested in any other branch of aviation whatsoever. I just wanted to be a fighter pilot, which I suspect is probably what actually led to uh, you know, my success going through the training and the selection processes, you know, because I was, I was absolutely single-minded in, in that aim. Stuff. So what year did you actually join the RAF and can you talk us through some of the aircraft you started training on before you went to your frontline jet? Yeah sure, well I, uh, I joined the Air Force in 1983, uh, winding the clock back a little bit. I was uh, in the Air Cadets from 1979 so I joined as soon as I was able to at age 13. Um, and I went through the, the sort of usual uh, progression up through the Air Cadets. So I was very lucky in that uh, in 1981 I uh, went and did my Air Cadet gliding uh, qualification uh, and went solo at the age of 16. Uh, RF Linton News on the volunteer gliding school there. Uh, and then uh, the following year I was really lucky enough to get a, an RAF flying scholarship which back in the 80s was worth 30 hours towards, uh, towards a private pilot's license which was 35 hours at the time. And uh, so that summer I went and did my, uh, my flying scholarship at uh, Leicester Aero Club. Uh, gave my PPL uh, a few months before I actually passed my driving test. Uh, and, uh, and then the following year I got, uh, got uh, selected to uh, go straight to Cranwell as a direct entry um, uh, officer. Uh, and so I went there straight after I'd finished my A-levels, uh, 31st of July 1983. A very uh, excited but slightly apprehensive 18 year old pitched up at uh, the RF College Cranwell uh, and met up with some people who became friends for life and uh, yeah so I went through Cranwell managed to uh, despite uh, an injury to my left knee which has plagued me all my life um, I actually got through uh, Cranwell at the first attempt so I only had to do 18 weeks there uh, I recuperated from my knee injury uh, and regained my medical in time to start my pilot training in I think it was uh, February uh, 1984 and because I had a PPL at the time um, the, 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 the ways through uh, elementary flying training at the time where if you had no flying experience um, then you went to a thing called the Flying Selection Squadron which used to be at RF Swinderby and it was 14 hours of learning, learning to fly or learning the nuances of the chipmunk Nice. Uh, of which subsequently I've got many hours on but I didn't have to go to uh, the Flying Selection Squadron at the time uh, so uh, because I had a PPL, I went straight in at basic flying training. Uh, and again, I was really lucky enough to go to the best of the flying training schools. There were three at the time. There was Cranwell, which nobody wanted to remain at, <laughs> having done their officer training there. There was Linton on News, which was, pr which was the second biggest one. Uh, and then there was Church Fenton. Yeah. Seven FTS at Church Fenton, and that was where I was lucky enough to go. And I was on number 18 course there. 
So we started, uh, I could say, in early 1984, flew the Jet Provost Mark III uh, for around about 100 hours until um, we got to a, a part of the course which was uh, sort of, in, uh, I think they called it initial uh, streaming. Um, and at that stage, they looked at all the people who'd got to the end of that particular phase of the course. Um, and uh, at that stage, they, they streamed you either fast jet, so what they called group one, phase one, um, group two, which was multi-engine, or group three, which was helicopters. And that was really where the, the course sort of split. Mm -hmm. And there were six of us out of the, uh, there were 19 of us that started the course. There were 12 of us that got to that stage. Uh, two or three of the guys dropped out and went to uh, train as navigators. Uh, but the remaining, uh, 12, out of the remaining 12 of us, there were six of us went group one, phase one, three went to multi-engine, and three went to uh, helicopters. Uh, so the guys that went to helicopters, I think they did a nominal five or six hours more flying than they went off to Shawbury. Uh, the uh, guys who went off to multi did a few more hours, and I think it was mostly uh, orientated towards instrument flying. Uh, but the, uh, the remainder of us, the, the group one, phase one, the six of us, went on to fly the mighty Jet Provost Mark V, which was a, a complete leap in, in performance. You know, a lot of people think Jet Provost is a Jet Provost. Yeah, well, it isn't. Yeah. You know, the Mark III, uh, it was known as constant thrust variable noise. You move the throttle and all it did was change the volume <laughs> of the engine. I, I do remember my first ever takeoff uh, in the Mark III. Uh, which was uh, like the, the course familiarization. I remember the brakes being released at the end of the runway and sitting there thinking, no. <laughs> uh, you know, what's going on? And we gently trundled down the runway. You know, the Mark III was, was pretty underpowered. I mean, it did the job because it, it taught you uh, an awful lot of uh, really basic stuff. You know, and it was a great fun aeroplane to fly, but then we moved on to the Mark V, which had a much more uh, powerful engine. It was the same engine that was in the Jet Provost Mark IV, mm -hmm. but the difference between the Mark V was it was a pressurized cabin. It had, a, it had a, an electric canopy, so rather than the, the, the old windy handled canopy which we had on the JP3, mm -hmm. uh, the Mark V had a lovely Gucci switch which you made and the canopy opened and closed on its own, but more importantly, you know, you just had that extra thrust it could go faster, so low level flying, we could do a massive 300 knots rather than 240 in the Mark, uh, Mark III. Uh, and you know, the rest of that course was, uh, was focused on formation flying and low level because of course, back in the 1980s, uh, the, um, you know, the whole ethos of the RAF you know, and fighting the, uh, the Warsaw Pact mm -hmm. in Central Europe, you know, the only way that you were going to do it effectively was at low level below radar course, which was a tactic that was proven in the Middle East during Gulf War I uh, to be out of date. You know, it was, it was a high risk, but of course in Central Europe with poor weather, you know, low level below the radar was really the only way back in those days that you could effectively, you know, fight the enemy. So of course everything was focused on uh, trying to make you a single seat pilot. And that was the thing. With, uh, with pilot training in the Air Force back in those days. Of course, nowadays, it's only single seat, so you've got to be good enough to fly the Typhoon or the F-35. Back then, there were an awful lot more frontline aeroplanes uh, available. And uh, you know, the, the whole aim of pilot training, right from the day that you go for that initial, uh, initial pilot selection, uh, back in my day it was Biggin Hill, but of course nowadays at Cranwell, um, the whole thing is the RF are looking f for single seat fast jet pilots mm -hmm. because they know along the way people are not quite going to make the grade uh, and therefore they can fill all the other seats by, um, you know, by people falling out from the fast jet uh, you know, stream, uh, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, you know, once you get into that fast jet training stream, that, that group one training thing, they're looking to fill the front line slots uh, with uh, people who are good enough to fly the single seat airplanes. And of course, the single seat airplanes of the day were, for ground attack, the Harrier, which was sort of seen as the cream of the crop, the Jaguar, and the Lightning. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, um, you know, I was focused, because I really wanted to go to Germany, I was focused on going to the Harrier. That's, oh, what, nice. I, that's what I wanted to do, all the way through my pilot training. Um, and that stuck with me, almost to the bitter end. And then my, then my mood changed through a, a very, very look encounter, uh, or two look encounters uh, in a way. 
Uh, the first one was part of the way through the, uh, the basic flying training course at Church Fenton, we had to go and do a couple of weeks adventurous training. And one of our number, a uh, lovely guy whose, whose name I shall keep from the, uh, from the public <laughs> domain, yes. uh, but went on to fly helicopters. Uh, he had a great idea that we should go to Cyprus on a subacqua diving expedition. Okay. Yeah, we did a bit of subacqua diving, yep. but we had two weeks in Cyprus, and at the time, the, uh, the resident squadron uh, doing their armament practice camp, their air to air gunnery camp, was 11 Squadron Lightnings. Mm. And so, of course, we got to socialize with them quite a lot, got to meet a lot of the guys. Um, and I always remember a couple of uh, individuals, uh, again, I'll keep their names out of the public domain, you know, who'd said, hey, if you ever want to come across to Binbrook, you know, come see what we do on the Lightning, then give us a call. And I always remember that. And uh, so anyway, finished the group one, phase one at Church Fenton, moved to Valley, uh, which at the time was purely advanced flying training on the Hawk. So the Hawks were still uh, red and white at the time. Yeah. Had a great time on, uh, on, the, uh, on the Hawk. Had a couple of little hiccups uh, with low level navigation. I think ev you know, everybody has a stumble along the way going through pilot training. Uh, but I had a fantastic uh, flight commander uh, on the squadron at Valley, who, uh, who was an ex Jaguar guy, and he sorted out my low level navigation, passed the course, uh, and uh, moved up. And then at the end, that was the point where we got, up, where we got our wings on the, uh, on the Group 1 uh, stream. So, November the 14th, 1985, proudly, uh, proudly got my wings. Um, and uh, I then had a few weeks to kick my heels before I started the tactical weapons course uh, down at RF Chivener, uh, flying the, uh, the nice camouflaged Hawks yes, with nice. guns and bombs and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and in that time, I was thinking, I can't do seven weeks in the middle of winter, you know, going back home to Yorkshire and just sitting in the cold. I've got to do something. So I remembered that contact uh, that I'd made with an individual um, at Binbrook. On, on 11 Squadron, um, you know, the, the invite to go along to Binbrook. So I made a call on a Friday afternoon. And I just happened to, it just happened to be that individual who picked up the phone in the crew room, rather bizarrely. Um, and I said, uh, hello, it's Grinner. Do you remember me from Cyprus last year? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, is there any chance of uh, coming up to, uh, to Binbrook for a couple of weeks? You know, just arranging a holding post. Uh, and he says, uh, hang on a moment, because we're actually in our afternoon weekly pilots meet. So I'll ask the boss, boss, do you remember Grinner? And I could hear this conversation going, he'd like to come across to Bimbrook for a couple of weeks. And the guy went, yeah, absolutely. You know, organize it. They went, yeah, I'll give you a call back in half an hour. And so within an hour, I had a two week uh, detachment at Bimbrook. Um, and so for the two weeks before Christmas in 1985, I drove up to Bimbrook you know, not knowing what to expect. I knew very little of the air defense world because of course, as I said earlier, all the training up to that point had been orientated towards, you know, single seat yeah. ground attack. And of course, you know, I'd been very, very singly minded like I had been as a kid of, you know, I want to go to Harriers, I want to go and fly out in Germany. And then I had two weeks at Binbrook, which completely changed my outlook. <laughs> um, you know, the air defense world, particularly the lightning air defense world, was a completely different, uh, completely different place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I loved it. I loved the way that they looked after me. Um, I loved the idea of the way the air defense worked in comparison with ground attack. You know, much more fluid, yeah. um, you know, very, very much more thinking on your feet type stuff, which is the thing I've always loved. Uh, with flying, whatever, whatever you know, part of flying that I've ever done. I've always loved that thinking ahead uh, and almost heading off a plan. Now, I've never been a chess player, uh, so I, you know, but I would imagine it's a little bit like playing chess, where you're trying to think two or three moves chess, ahead. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, str strangely enough, yeah, I've, I've never learned chess, and I guess I probably never will nowadays, but uh, yeah. Um, and so I, I left Binbrook. They flew me five times. In, in a two-seater, which of course cemented my desire. <laughs> you know, got in this aeroplane, I sort of went, this is the thing that I saw, I, I saw with my dad at that air mm -hmm. show uh, that year, and, and this is for me. And it was really bizarre, you know, having been you know, orientated towards Harrier, all that time, I was changed. And of course, I turned up at uh, Chivner on day one, 2nd of January, 1986, and we had our, uh, we had our induction uh, and I remember the, uh, the, the guy who was in charge of ground school there was a retired squadron leader, a lovely guy called, called Chris Gold. 
And Chris had been a hunter man. Uh, in fact, he'd been a hunter squadron commander out in Aden, you know, to give you an idea of his, uh, of, of his uh, sort of um, uh, prestige. And he was a really, really well-known guy. Uh, and Chris's welcome to us was, uh, good morning, gentlemen, welcome to Fighter Command. Mm. And we sort of, oh, we're here. And of course, we went around the room, and of course, I was one of the last to, to you know, wh where do you want to go? What do you want to do? I, I want to go to Lightnings. And of course, all my, all my course mates just looking around at me going, what? Well. You've changed your tune <laughs> <laughs> since we saw you a couple of months ago. Uh, and that was it. And I was really, really lucky uh, at, uh, at Chivener in that, again, it was a course that I just loved the flying. Mm -hmm. You know, the, now, you know, learning to operate the aeroplane for a purpose. You know, and we were doing, you know, we were going off with real bombs, albeit four kilogram practice bombs. Still. We were going off with live guns to do air to air gunnery, air to ground gunnery. You know, we were charging around doing really tactical stuff in formations. Um, and I loved it. I just loved that environment, you know. And a guy that uh, arrived at the same time as me at Chivener to go on the staff uh, was a bloke who just left five squadron lightnings. Mm. And he was on the same squadron as me, 151. So he was going through his staff workup, you know, his Hawk re refamiliarization, yeah. his staff workup. And he basically took me under his wing and, uh, and was really a sponsor for me to go to the Lightning. Oh. So when, I, when it got to postings, you know, the magic words. Yeah. Pi you know, I think I was flying officer at the time, flying officer uh, Derek Smith. Lightnings, uh, yes. <laughs> and so that, that was my, that was my uh, flying training till I got to the Lightning. Brilliant stuff. So let's talk about the Lightning. Okay. What was the original purpose design of the Lightning? And was it the same when you joined this, um, the force? Well, the, the original uh, purpose of the Lightning was, uh, was a, a, as really a point defense interceptor. You know, it never, it, I don't think it was ever designed to go long distances. It was designed to be able to get airborne, to react quickly uh, from point defense, uh, you know, around the country and to be able to, you know, do a supersonic dash to meet any incoming uh, bombers uh, as far away from the UK as it possibly could, intercept those bombers, knock them out of the sky and then come back. So that was the original purpose. And of course, you know, they wanted an aeroplane that could go significantly faster than uh, the sound barrier. You know, I mean, we're, we're standing here with, with the perfect sort of iteration of aeroplanes. You know, we've got the Lightning behind me here, but in the far corner, we've got the very first jet fighter uh, that's only sort of 10 years older uh, in design than the Lightning is, and that's the Meteor, followed by the Vampire. And of course, the Vampire was tied in with the Venom, which had a slightly swept wing, which meant it could go a little bit faster. But it was essentially, they, they were essentially very much subsonic aeroplanes with straight wings. Uh, the sound barrier had been an issue for many, many years. Yeah. And then, of course, this beautiful aeroplane, the Hunter, uh, appeared, which I still think is the, most, is the best looking jet that's ever been built and, f and still flies uh, today. You know, because I think as a kid, if you were, if you were asked to uh, draw a jet aeroplane, yeah. that's what you draw Absolutely. or something very, very similar. Yeah. You know, uh, but of course the Hunter, you know, was, was limited in, in the fact that it only had a single engine. It, they never ever uh, did it afterburn the engine in that. Same engine as the, the Lightning, except they built an aeroplane. Very, very bold design. I mean, you know, when you look at aeroplane design in the 19, sort of late 1940s and early 50s, you know, the designers were really clever. You know, they really understood the issues of, of transonic problems, supersonic flight. You know, uh, and that can be seen in, in the advancement of designs of the Vulcan. You know, you look at the Lancaster's of the Vulcan, you know, 10 years, you yeah. know, the, the only it's difference, crazy, you know, and you're looking at 10 years from the meteor to the lightning. You know, you've got a highly swept wing, which of course is perfect for supersonic flight. Uh, not fantastic at uh, subsonic flight, it's certainly low speed subsonic flight. But having said that, you know, what you've essentially got with the design of the lightning here is because of the low tail, and that was a, that was a, a design, uh, a, a fantastic bit of design work with the low, the low tail, is what you effectively get from the Lightning is a delta wing. Mm. You know, so if you look at that and compare it with the Mirage 3, the Mirage 2000 uh, type design, which is very much a delta, mm -hmm. you know, you've got all the design uh, uh, features of a, of a delta wing without a delta wing. 
you know, so, you know, but there's a lot of disadvantages with deltas as well, which, of course, as, as aeroplanes have advanced, you know, towards Typhoon, Rafale and stuff like that, you know, they've managed to, you know, work around by having, you know, different, different aerodynamic uh, improvements to the aeroplanes. Um, but, you know, you've got an aeroplane here that will, would go supersonic incredibly easily. Mm. It would go supersonic in, in dry power, so not afterburns. You can just leave the engines at full power so in dry cruise. power, and it would it would go supersonic. Whether it would supercruise or not, I don't know, because I don't think I don't know whether anybody ever ever tried, tried it. it. So yeah. I, I would I would say probably not. Yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, it would very easily go through the sound barrier without you mm. trying. It was one of the biggest things with this aeroplane. Um, when you when you when you fly a high performance aeroplane, you know at low level you fly uh, indicated airspeed, um, and at some stage you transition to Mach number uh, as you climb, because as as you climb and maintain uh, an indicated airspeed, uh, your Mach number goes up. So eventually, if you don't do anything about it, and still the climbing speed of that was 450 knots, mm. so quite high, uh, you would very quickly go supersonic. You'd cr very quickly reach Mach one. Um, and with this aeroplane, uh, the Mark VI, uh, which is essentially what the, um, the Saudi Mark 53 yeah. was, it's a, it's a UK Mark VI, um, 450 knots Mach 0.9, so 0.9 times, the, point, point .9 times the speed of sound, so just under the speed of sound. Um, you had to be very, that transition used to happen, I seem to remember, around about 20,000 feet. Right. And you had to be ready for it, ready for it yeah. because it was a very positive adjustment to the climb attitude, which was already quite steep, even in, dry, even in cold power. So I'm not talking about afterburner. That, that was even more entertaining to yeah, try and imagine. control the speed. <laughs> but so you climb at 450 and then you had to transition to 0.9. And if you missed it, and people did, then Grimsby usually got a, 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 su a subtle boom um, <laughs> going out because that's about where it all used to happen. Yeah, you know, so yeah. So could you talk us through some of your ground and flying training on the Lightning? Yeah, sure. Um, well, as with all courses, it always starts with a, with a period of ground school. Uh, now, certainly when I went through Lightning training flight, uh, and it wasn't an OCU at the time, it was actually a training flight and had been for many, many years, uh, the courses were only generally two people. Uh, so, oh, really? so, yeah, oh. Be because the squadrons were so small, oh. bear, bear in mind the, the Lightning training flight was only servicing Two, two squadrons, oh, okay. uh, and each of those squadrons only had 15 pilots on, which included the boss and the flight commanders. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was just to keep topping up the squadrons oh, yeah. as people left to move on or retire. Um, and so uh, we, you know, you would turn up and you'd do a period of ground school. I can't remember how long the ground school was. I'm guessing probably two or three weeks, uh, where you got all the, the aircrew manuals and you just worked through them all. You know, and you learn the systems, and of course, there's two sides to to convert into a fighter aircraft. Unlike what I do in, in my actual job now, where you've only got to learn the aeroplane and how to fly it. You know, the first part is learning how to fly it. The second part is learning how to operate it. Uh, and so you learn about the aeroplane and the systems. So you need to know about the, the engines. You need to know about the hydraulics. You need to know about the electrical systems and how the, and how they work. Um, but then, of course, you've got to learn about the weapon systems. Uh, which there, there are several bits of the weapon system, you know, because you've got the radar, which is in the bullet, uh, in the nose. Uh, again, a very, very clever bit of design work by, uh, by, by the designers at English Electric at the time uh, was, uh, was having that shaped bullet in the nose because that directed the airflow to uh, break up the supersonic uh, flow. Um, you know, when, because what you, don't, you can't have supersonic airflow actually going into the engine. The engine wouldn't work. So you've got to break down that supersonic airflow to make it subsonic to go into the engines. So, and the fact is that that bullet didn't move. If you look at every, any other aeroplane, you know, so we're going to have a look at the Tornado later, it had movable ramps. The F4 Phantom had movable ramps. If you look at the MiG-21, which has got a bullet that's not dissimilar to that. The bullet moves. Yes. And the bullet moves, you know, to move the transonic shockwave. Uh, even the SR-71, yeah. the bullets, the, the, the uh, bullets in the nacelles actually moved to, uh, to move the, uh, move the shockwave. Mm. This didn't. Very, 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 very clever, clever uh, system. Nice. But in the middle of that is a radar. And that was a limitation because the radar dish 
you know, so back in those days, you know, and until relatively recent years, you know, radars had to be something mechanical, it had to be a dish that could send out sufficient energy, and it's all mechanical. So the whole thing has to be moved and has to be housed in that. And it's not very big. The bullet is, I think off the top of my head, probably about twice that length going back into the engine. Mm -hmm. And that's all the radar gubbins, that's you it. know. But then you've got all the weapons computers that are, uh, that are involved in that as well. So we had to learn about how the radar worked, how the weapon aiming computer worked, um, and how to operate it. And that was the really difficult bit with the, uh, with the lightning. Uh, because not only did you have to fly the aeroplane, you then actually had to operate the radar, get something useful out of it, and there was nothing, nothing automatic about that. <laughs> you had to manually scan the radar. It was scanned left and right, but you had to manually move the scanner up and down, you know, lock the radar on if that's, if that's what you were going to do. Um, so, you know, to help us with that, we had the simulator. Now, the lightning simulator was actually quite reasonable. Really? It, it was quite reasonable for its day. Yeah. Bearing in mind, you're talking about something that was built in the 1960s. Yes. I, th I do believe the original did have some, have some visuals, but you'd, right. you'd have to speak to somebody who was around in those yes. days to guarantee. It certainly didn't have visuals uh, back in my day, so it was very much a procedures trainer. Yeah. Of course, in the early days, it was used for you learning all your checks and you know, flying the aeroplane, albeit without any visual. Um, and you know you had to be able to operate the aeroplane to a good level before you'd be, or, or sorry, the simulator before they'd even let you near near an aeroplane itself. Um, and then, of course, they sort of concentrated on the radar stuff after you'd learnt to fly the aeroplane. So once you'd completed the the general ground school, you then went and flew the aeroplane. Mm -hmm. And the conversion course, like any other conversion course for a fighter, is split them into two bits. One is flying the aeroplane, and the other bit is learning how to operate it. Mm -hmm. And quite often, if people failed the course, and this was particularly so with the Lightning, it wasn't generally people having difficulties flying the aeroplane. Yeah. I mean, the flying characteristics, bear in mind, all I'd flown was light aeroplanes, the Jet Provost and the Hawk at this time. You know, the Hawk, brilliant aeroplane but it didn't replicate the handling no, of this. Okay. You know, very, very different uh, in, in its operating concept. Um, but people generally got, got, got the hang of that reasonably quickly. The bit that people generally fell down on was the operating of the radar, the tactical bit. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was usually because concentrating on that, your flying breaks down <laughs> and you just can't manage the workload. And it's all about workload. Yes, of course, yeah. Um, and, but that was, the, that was the, the great thing. That was the, that was the real challenge, was trying to get the best out of it. Um, the radar, dis I mean, I'll, I'll talk about the, the, the actual conversion first, then we'll talk about the, the actual radar bit. Lightning training flight had two marks of uh, lightning on it. They had one mark six, which similar to this, had the, the f didn't have the gun pack in, it had the bigger ventral tank. Mm -hmm. So the, the UK Mark 6s that we, we operated on the squadrons had the uh, two Aden guns pack in the forward part of the ventral tank. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, great, great health and safety, you know, if you suggested putting two dirty great big guns in the front of a fuel tank, yep. you know, you'd go, what, yeah. nowadays? <laughs> but, you know, back then that was the acceptable thing to do. So you had two 30 millimeter Aden cannons which sat in a gun pack, which reduced the, the ventral, uh, ventral fuel tank mm -hmm. uh, capacity by a certain amount. The, uh, the, the LTF operated for the students the Mark III, which was the uh, previous version of the single seater to the Mark VI. Because the, the Lightning itself went Mark I um, and various sort of versions of the Mark I. Then it went to the Mark II. Then it went to the Mark III. Uh, and the Mark III was the first of the Lightnings that didn't have a gun. Oh, really? Did not have a gun, you know, because they we're in the era of, of the missile and, you know, the missile yeah. was going to be the, the panacea of everything. And of course, as history has proved, it isn't. You know, the, the, the one thing you can guarantee in, in, you know, electronic warfare and everything else is, you know, the only thing that can physically jam a gun is a physical stoppage. Yeah. You know, whereas you can jam radars, you can jam missiles, you can, you know, decoy missiles mm -hmm. in various ways, albeit missiles are getting, getting more, uh, are getting cleverer these days. 
Um, so, so yeah, the Mark III was the uh, was the first version without the uh, without the gun. Um, and then, of course, you had the two two seater version. So you had the Mark IV, which was essentially the uh, the two seater that was designed for the Mark One and Two. Okay. The Mark One and Two uh, and the Mark IV, the T4 had a straight wing. If you actually look at the leading edge of this wing, it's not straight. It's very slightly cranked. Mm. It runs back and it's got a very slight crank just in front of uh, where, the, uh, where the undercarriage is and then another crank about three quarters of the way out mm. where the, the wing sweep comes in, comes slightly less uh, or slightly less of an angle and it gives better handling. Slightly bigger wing area as well. The other thing is you see this airplane's got quite a large fin with with a flat top on it the fin on the mark one the mark twos and uh, the t4 was a smaller rounded top fin as well so that actually limited the maximum speed so although the lightning was toted as a mac 2 plus airplane i do believe the earlier ones were officially limited to 1.8 oh, right. officially right. officially yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's to do with directional stability at supersonic speeds because supersonic, air, supersonic uh, uh, aerodynamics are completely different to subsonic ones, yes. so, which we won't go into. The, thing, and the other thing about the, the earlier marks as well is they had an absolutely straight wing. So again, the handling was very, very slightly different. You know, it, was, it was noticeable when finally got to fly Mark VI. Oh, actually, this is a little bit better handling than the, than the so uh, other airplanes. You could actually tell the difference, right. yeah. It, and, and it was generally at, at the slower speeds because you know, pre-stall buffet, you know, normally something you get only a few knots above the stall with a swept-wing aeroplane, like the Hunter, and very definitely the, the Lightning, you're just constantly flying in the buffet below about 300 knots. But what was noticeable was the, the Mark VI didn't buffet quite as early as, uh, quite as, early as the Mark III. Mm -hmm. That's my memory of it anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be other Lightning people out there who well, I don't remember oh, that, yeah, or we'll no, it was the other way around. <laughs> so, the, so there will be feedback on that one. So, uh, but that's certainly what I remember of it. And so we flew the Mark III, and we flew the Mark V, which was the, 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 essentially the two-seater version of this. So, uh, and some comedian decided that because the Mark V was, or the, the two-seater cockpit was quite tiny, that unlike the Mark IV, where they, they had a set of throttles in the middle, which just got in the way of everybody's knees, apparently, for the instructor, they swapped it round. So the instructor had to fly with his left hand with the throttles outboard. Oh, God, right. Yeah which was quite, quite interesting yeah. Yeah. for people who only ever flown aeroplanes yeah. with their right hand. Uh, the instructors were very good and they adapted, so obviously it wasn't too much of an issue. So what we did was you would do uh, the initial conversion to solo on the aeroplane. Now the Mark V was, didn't have a lot of fuel, did not have a lot of fuel. In fact, the Mark III didn't have a lot of fuel as well. I seem to remember it was something like seven and a half thousand pounds of fuel uh, at startup. Mm. which if you divide by 2.2 will give you not a lot of kilograms so it gives you an, a, a rough idea mm -hmm. of how little fuel the aeroplane actually carried um, and that really limited you particularly at low level and of course on your conversion flights what do you need to do you need to learn how to land fly an approach and land it mm -hmm. and that is the uh, tricky thing with the lightning is you know is getting the landing right and being able to you know have a reasonably sta you know a stable approach to be able to land the thing in the right place on the runway Things with the Lightning that uh, really limited it, note how thin the tyres are. Yeah. Very, very, very thin. <laughs> they're very, very thin tyres. And of course, because they're so thin, they had to be that thin because the wing's not very thick. And they had to be able to fold the, the undercarriage away into the wing. So uh, the answer to having really thin tyres like that is you've got to inflate them to quite a high pressure and off the top of my head, somewhere around about 350 PSI. And you have to use nitrogen because you can't just use normal air to inflate to that because it just wouldn't work. So you have to use uh, nitrogen to, uh, to inflate the tires. And you would scrub on, a norm, on normal operations, you'd scrub a set of tires in five landings. <laughs> if you had a crosswind, you could scrub a set of tires in one landing. So you can see that actually doing touch and goes, which of course was the sort of the normal way of making sure that you could land an aeroplane, you know, on the Hawk and the Jet Provost, you know, you can't really do. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so the way that I remember the way it was done on my first flight, which lasted 30 minutes, essentially all your conversion flights in the Mark V 
we're with 30 minutes because that's all the fuel would Would that allow. Be like reheat takeoffs and everything or? No, we, uh, you only did a reheat takeoff actually in the Mark VI because it was a heavier aeroplane. Okay. But in the Mark III and the Mark V, you did dry power takeoffs. All right. So you could do a reheat takeoff in it. But it just accelerated so quickly. Yeah. I mean, it was good fun, and we, we, I did do them subsequently in the in the two seater and the and the single seat Mark III. When on the rare opportunity, I got to fly it after I'd left the LTF. Uh, but no, we only ever did uh, dry power takeoffs. Um, but uh, certainly that first flight, I seem to remember that the instructor, the QFI, came back and he demonstrated a touch and go yeah. to show me the landing technique. And then we got airborne, we went back into the circuit. He handed control to me and I did my first landing. And that was the only touch and go that I ever did, <laughs> planned. There were times when if the brake chute failed, we used to get airborne again to come around because we had a different, like, slightly different stopping technique, not a different landing technique, but a different stopping technique mm -hmm. if we had no brake chute. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, so we used to employ that uh, if required. And I think I only ever did about two or three times where I actually bolted, got airborne and, and landed number, again. It's, it's not bad, it's not bad. So, uh, and, and, and so those first few trips were to get you to a stage where you could land the aeroplane. So after doing five landings, <laughs> five landings, um, myself, uh, that was it. Five trips, two and a half hours on the aeroplane. I then went and did my first solo in a Mark III. Mm -hmm. So having learnt all the checks and all the flows for starting the aeroplane up and taxing it out and getting it airborne in the simulator, I then had to relearn the Mark V, which of course is a completely different cockpit because it's side by side and everything's in a totally different position. You then go back into the single seater and you do your first solo in the single seater. What was that like? Amazing. It's actually one of the few flights I remember pretty much. Uh, and I can remember it for, for two or three things really. And the first one was I, was, I was so keyed up with it that I really didn't think about what I was doing until I was taxiing out. And I remember taxiing out, and I'm quite a broad-shouldered guy, having been a swimmer as a kid. Um, you know, so my, my shoulders pretty much touched the canopy edges. <laughs> um, and I was taxiing out um, to get airborne on runway 21 at, at Binbrook. And there was a long straight, after you got off the, the ramp, there was a sort of like a, a long straight before a right-hand turn to go down towards the, uh, the holding point for the runway. And I remember allowing myself a few moments to look in the two mirrors, the two rear view mirrors that are on the, uh, the top of the canopy, uh, and just seeing my reflection and just these very, very, very highly swept wings behind me and thinking, oh my good God, <laughs> <laughs> 21 years old, and here I am about to be unleashed with, with this amazing aeroplane. Mm -hmm. You know, something that I'd been, I'd wanted since the age of eight, yeah. you know. I got on the runway and I seem to recall that pretty much I was behind events for the rest of the flight until I'd landed. Uh, but uh, I, did a, I do remember sort of climbing up through the clouds and getting above a layer of clouds into the open air and putting the burners in. <laughs> nice. For about five seconds, they kicked in. I felt them, oh, and I took them out again. And that was the only time I touched the burners in that flight uh, you know, at all. Yeah. Um, came back, landed. And uh, fortunately for me, there was a little, uh, a little uh, joke that the ground crew used to have with, uh, with first solo Lightning students. Uh, and that was that uh, they were really, really quick at replacing things like brake chutes, doing tire changes, and I said, you know, wearing tires. So they were constantly changing main wheel tires. Uh, or main wheels, because they change the whole thing. They don't yeah. just change the tire. Um, and they, they could do it in a few minutes. You know, we're, we're talking literally, you know, sort of Formula One type changes. Um, uh, but the brake chutes, they were really, really quick at doing. Uh, now, the brake chute is, is really a two-man job. Uh, and it's quite a trick, because the brake chute sits underneath the uh, tail uh, in, a, in a stowage that's about this big. Uh, but the wire goes around the jet pipes and plugs in to a plug just above the top jet pipe. You know, obviously that would be hot with people taxiing in. And what the Grand Cree used to do on a first solo was you'd taxi in and by the time you'd shut down and climbed out, 
you know, somebody will go, enjoy your flight. I think you might be in trouble, sir. Uh -oh. And then they take you around and go, you didn't pull the brake shoe. And you go, yeah, I did. And you, go, you didn't. Look, it's still in there. Because by the time you got out, they got the new brake shoot in and connected. Uh, so they wind you and up. they would wind people up. <laughs> um, and I do remember Ian Black getting caught with that one who was on the course after me. <laughs> so he might deny it, but I do remember him being got by it. Uh, but I'd already seen it, so they didn't, they didn't try it on yeah, me because I'd, I'd yeah. seen them do it on somebody previously. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I did get away with that one. Well, and then, of course, you know, from that first solo, you did other solos, and you know, did I ever relax into it? I don't think I ever relaxed into flying the aeroplane because it was just one of those aeroplanes that could very, very easily bite you. you know? The one, one thing I did learn flying the Lightning over the two years that I flew it, and I had just under 400 hours on it in those two years, uh, was my um, respect for fuel you know, okay. fuel management. Yeah, yeah. And I probably did exactly the same as everybody else. Oh, I'll just do one more turn in this combat. Or, ah, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I'm now short of fuel, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you know, I fly with people now in commercial airliners, you know, who talk about being short of fuel. You know, I quite often say, mate, you've never been short of fuel until you've even climbed into one of these. Yeah. Because quite often, you know, when I've got colleagues talking about being short of fuel, they've still got more than we ever started with yeah, in these. Crazy. You know, it's, 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 it's a crazy situation, you know, but I did learn that respect for fuel management, which stuck with me, you know, throughout the whole of my time. Mm -hmm. But I can, I can talk a little bit about the radar stuff yep. as well. Uh, the radar on this, you've got to remember it really sort of, I wouldn't say it's first generation radar, because of course radar developed in, in the Second World War, um, and uh, they developed various ways of, uh, of getting that picture. The radar and the, the, what was called the fire control computer in this aeroplane was actually really clever. Desi uh, uh, designed by Francis, um, and they, they did a fabulous job on it. Uh, and actually there's a computer in there that once you had radar contact on a target, you could, you could set a, a, a dial that I seem to remember was from one to six. You could lock on, and it actually had a computer, and bear in mind we're talking about computer with cogs and wheels uh, at that time. That, that, could, um, that could calculate the correct intercept depending on what you wanted to do. And I remember a one, the setting one was for a stern intercept and for, for uh, the setting six was a high flying supersonic target where you were going to do a head on attack. And it was brilliant. It really did, did work very well in that provided you could get the contact with the target, you could lock, lock the radar on, it would do all the calculations and it would tell you when to pull up because generally a high flying supersonic target is going to be well above you going quite fast so you would accelerate at a lower level and at some stage it would tell you give you a steering indication to pull up and then it would tell you when to pull the trigger okay. uh, dependent and the whole system i mean you know two two different weapons packs so the early ones had fire streak uh, the later ones had red top and actually we flew a mix of the two uh, even in 1986, 87, 88, we flew a mix of the two. The fire streak, which is what that model is uh, there by the side of the aeroplane, very much a stern aspect uh, missile. But the red top was actually one of the really first uh, generation that had a limited head-on capability. Mm. You know, because it's looking at a slightly different part of the infrared mm -hmm. spectrum. And so it was able to pick up not only you know, the heat coming out of a, a jet pipe, uh, coming head on, uh, but it would also pick up the heating on the leading edges of an aeroplane, a, a supersonic aeroplane. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually gets quite hot on its leading edges, and that's what a missile uh, with a head-on capability, an infrared missile with a head-on capability, is actually looking at. Um, and uh, so, you know, th the whole weapon pack itself and the fire control computer used to talk to itself, or t t talk, talk to each other, um, and, you know, it'd put you on this intercept geometry uh, and you know, it would tell you when you were in range and you could pull the trigger, but nothing would happen until one of the missiles had acquired the target and then it would fire the missile. That's pretty clever. So it was it really, really clever stuff yeah, yeah. For, its, for its time. Mm. You know, bear in mind we're talking 1960s technology here. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. I mean, we, the, the only time we actually employed the fire control computer was uh, doing uh, head on stuff, uh, but all the other stuff we used to do without locking the radar on. And we used to do stern intercepts by, um, you know, manually working out the intercept headings, 
and the intercept geometry, mm -hmm. which required you to be able to look into the radar scope. Now, radar scopes these days are nice synthetic TV screens. Yeah. The one in that is a cathode ray tube. It's <laughs> what, what TVs used to be yeah, the old back, back in the day. Yeah, yeah. You know, but this is a cathode ray tube with the limitations of the cathode ray tube, like you can't see it in broad daylight. Mm -hmm. And you'll have seen photos of what looked like a Wellington boot. Oh, yes. Sticking out. Yes. And that was there as a protection around the uh, radar so that you could actually put your head in to, to read the radar. So when you were flying, you know, you'd, you'd have the, 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 ra the, the radar boot unfolded and it would sit, I seem to remember about here. Bear in mind, it's a good few years now, but you sit about here. So you'd be flying along, you, you operated the radar controller with your left hand. It just sits just, just behind uh, the throttles. Uh, and one of the best sort of radar controllers uh, that, that, that you could possibly have, you know, re really, really easy to, to operate to that extent. How effective you were depended on how, how you manipulated the controls, because there was very little automatic about it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you were having to manually adjust the gain of the radar to try and get a picture of a blip. And that was it, that was all the radar gave you. Yeah. It gave, there was you know, no track while scan, no other target information. It just gave you a blip to look at. Um, and so you'd be flying along and you'd be putting your head in the, in the boot. So that was the, you know, that was the challenge. Yeah. The real challenge was doing it at night, oh God. in the dark, at a low level, <laughs> over the sea. You know, on that a can't on be a pleasant. It wasn't, and that was probably the most challenging bit of bit of the whole job mm -hmm. was was doing that sort of stuff in the dark. Mm -hmm. And I probably learned some of my biggest lessons on safety. Mm -hmm. You know, doing intercepts like that. Uh, I remember being given, uh, particularly when I was doing my uh, uh, QRA workup, uh, and we used to have to uh, do shadowing. Uh, of, of slow speed targets over the sea at low level. And I was doing them with my, with my flight commander uh, one dirty, dark evening in, uh, in late 1986, maybe early 1987. Um, and he was maneuvering all over the place. Uh, so much so that I just lost the air picture of what was going on. Um, and we did have a, a, a Radalt uh, in, the Mark, uh, in the Mark VI. Uh, it was a very, very basic Radalt uh, and we used to set set uh, the low-level warner uh, but the low-level warner used to come on if you exceed if you went beyond 60 degrees angle of bank which you quite mm -hmm. often did when you were maneuvering mm -hmm. um, and I got to the stage that night where I wasn't sure that the uh, warning light was coming on because of my maneuvering or because I was going through the minimum oh height God, yeah, yeah, and so I remember just pulling away from the sea knocking it off, off yeah. we flew back to Binbrook and the debrief which was in the in the bar over a beer was uh, so my dear chap, <laughs> how did you find that? And it was one of the most pleasant debriefs. I learned so much that night. You know, and most importantly, I learned when not to push my luck. Yeah, of course. You yeah. know, and unfortunately, you know, over the years, people did push the luck occasionally and, yeah. and paid for it. You exactly. know, paid, paid the ultimate price. So uh, yeah. obviously, I'm still, still here. here. I'm still stuff. here and in one piece. So yeah. So I want to talk about your time on the two squadrons you flew with. Yeah. And did you ever conduct any DACT? Because I'm fascinated. And how did the lightning fare against the types <laughs> of the time? On uh, the yeah. Uh, I would. I was really lucky um, in the period when I when I went to the lightning because of course there was an end game. The lightning for many years, and certainly in the early days, they did very little air combat training at all and DACT you know I guess if you spoke to somebody who was on the squadrons in the in the 60s and maybe even to the set in well into the 70s you know they probably did very little ACT I we you know I was really lucky we were really lucky and myself in black and the crowd who sort of went through in those latter few years because there was an end in sight they knew the airplane was finally going to be going out of service when the F3 came in and so they looked at the fatigue that was available uh, on the aeroplanes. So I went, well, we can afford to do this now. So as I went through the LTF, they actually changed the course and they actually included more air combat training. Brilliant. Uh, now we didn't do any DACT on the LTF because a lot of what you do on, on uh, OCUs is, is very canned training. But certainly when we got out onto the squadron, yes, we did. Um, and I was very, very lucky in that in my first year, I did DACT uh, against uh, the American aggressors. We used to have a, an aggressor squadron F5, based in the, in the UK. Yeah, they were Alconbury yeah. and they were F5, F5Es. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, uh, and they were really good. They were a great training asset uh, because, of course, they were Soviet, you know, stroke Warsaw Pact experts. And you've got to bear in mind this was still in the middle of the Cold War yeah. by this stage, you know, so the Warsaw Pact and the Soviets were still very, very much our enemy at the time. And, um, and so they used to come along and uh, teach you the tactics that things like MiG-21s uh, would be able to employ. Um, and the great thing about the F-5 was it's a really small aeroplane like the MiG-21 was, so really difficult to mm -hmm. spot head on. Um, I remember doing a couple of uh, DACT flights uh, against, the, uh, against the aggressors. Um, and I sort of vaguely remember faring okay, because of course they were operating the aeroplane very much um, as, as a Soviet would operate a MiG-21. Yeah. yeah, so they're, they're, they're operating it as that rather than really going for it with, a, with the F-5, which I know is quite, quite, a, quite an amazing aeroplane. Um, you know, so it was to teach me the, the confidence in the tactics. Um, did a little bit against F-16s. Uh, my first, uh, I was very, very lucky in that uh, my first NATO squadron exchange was to Belgium, um, and uh, we went out to uh, Bovershain which was the home of 349 and 350 uh, squadrons, Belgian Air Force, and they were pure uh, air defense uh, F-16 squadrons back in those days. Um, you know, the Belgian Air Force, like many of our European forces have you know, shrunk. In fact, we have, we've shrunk yep. accordingly as well. Uh, but back then they were pure air defense squadrons and we did a bit of DACT against them and it was demoralizing. <laughs> it really was demoralizing because you could yeah. meet these guys head on. Uh, Unless you got them unsighted, which was very, very unlikely, yeah. you know, then you, you had no chance. We, we did more sort of stuff uh, with the F-16s, uh, doing what we called mixed fighter force uh, against uh, ground attack guys um, when we were operating out of, uh, out of Belgium. Mm -hmm. Did get a flight in the F-16 as well, which nice. was quite awesome. Yeah, I like um, that. that was my first flight in an F-16. Um, other airplanes did uh, DACT against uh, was quite often the uh, was quite often the F four. Our um, F four. Yeah. Um, I don't don't recall ever doing anything against any any other air forces F four, but certainly d we did quite quite a bit of stuff uh, against the Watersham uh, wing, which was uh, uh, fifty six and seventy four squadrons, mm -hmm. um, and and the Lightning fared pretty well, you know overall. I mean obviously disadvantages the F four had a much better radar you know, because they had pulse Doppler radar with a much greater range. Uh, and of course, they had the Sparrow missile as well. So they had, the, they had the ability to shoot beyond visual range. And of course, biggest disadvantage with the airplanes, they had no radar warning receivers. So you had no idea whether you were being targeted or not. Yeah. You had to assume you were. And so your, t your tactics were always uh, devised around assuming that you were being targeted. So you would so do all- the whole, the whole time you're just assuming. <laughs> you would, you, yeah. Uh, and, and you can, you, you can preempt, you know, if you know roughly what, what, what their shooting ranges are going to be, then you do something approaching that range to mess up their air picture and to try and get into the merge unsighted. If we got into the merge unsighted and we're able to, you know, start doing a turning fight with an F4, then, uh, then you know, you're evenly, relatively evenly matched. I mean, certainly one of the great advantages of this aeroplane Oh, was the ability to take take the fight vertical. Yeah. So rather than going round and round and round level, uh, or in descending turn, if you had enough energy, you could loop the aeroplane. Could a um, fan keep up with you in that? Uh, that if they were light, light and they had the energy, yes. But if they bled the energy, then they would struggle to right. to be able to get up. So they used to have to generally stay flat if they burnt off too much energy. Mm -hmm. Yes, they could come up and meet you. You know, if 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 they were canny and they had sufficient energy, yes, they could go vertical. But again, you'd be meeting over the top and the advantage that you had with this aeroplane, and it was something they showed us on, on, the, uh, on the conversion, is that because it's effectively a delta wing aeroplane, you can vary the amount of, of, I mentioned about the buffet earlier, mm -hmm. the buffet is the pre-stall buffet. Um, and you, uh, you know, you're, certainly when you're doing a turning fight, you're always turning in that buffet. And the level of the buffet um, you know, varies from a small amount to a lot. Um, and the great thing about the Lightning was it, it was generally a very, very easily, easy handling aeroplane. You know, it didn't have any significant vices mm -hmm. compared to, you know, if you, if you pulled too much in the Phantom, it would depart and depart very, very spectacularly. 
So yeah, it was nothing like the F4 because I was, that had a bad reputation. It had a really bad reputation. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I never flew the F4, but I understand that you know if it buffeted, you couldn't use the, the ailerons at all to roll because, yeah, of course, it used spoilers, uh, and uh, so the thing would depart. Whereas this, you know, actually handled really, really well. Right. Um, you know, in, in a lot of heavy buffet. And one of the things that you could do in this, you could pull up for a loop at 450 knots. You could go over the top of the loop, then pull into really heavy buffet and keep the speed. And the speed would stick back sort of below 300 knots. And you could pull out of the loop about 2,000 feet above where you'd started. And of course, that's a great advantage if you're following an aeroplane you know, trying to dive down and not, not lose too much energy. Yeah. You know, so, uh, and it, it did, it, you know, if you were pulling too hard, it had its little, little hint. It used to hint to you because the nose used to wander so it a little bit. You. It would tell you, mm -hmm. yeah, because I, I did do it once, actually, DACT against some F4s. We'd gone into a merge. We were doing a 2v2, uh, and the plan was that my, my colleague would go in level, and I would go into the merge, and I'd go vertical over the top, choose my moment, and pitch down. And I remember watching this, this fight going on below me, looking out, because of course I'm upside down over the top of it. And I pulled and the world rotated through about 90 degrees. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> but, you know, it was easily recoverable. And I uh, just unloaded the wing and it stopped, the world stopped going around and I carried on fighting, you know. So uh, I do remember that, you know. So the aeroplane, if you were pulling too hard, used to, I, I do remember, used to want, you know, the nose would start wandering and start sort of yawing out of the, a turn if you're in a turn. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was it, hinting, mm, don't pull any harder, <laughs> you know, I'm going to have you if you keep doing yeah, this. Exactly. <laughs> so, and it, and it did on that particular day. So, uh, um, also, also fought against the F3 as well. Um, and again, you know, actually it was reasonably, you know, reasonably equal, you know, against the F3. You know, in a in a visual fight, uh, again the F3 had you know had a better radar. Although back in those days when we did it, it was very rare that they actually had a working radar because the, the 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 early days of the AI24 and the Tornado F3 was just appalling. Mm -hmm. You know, so quite often it was just going to a visual fight with these guys, uh, and of course they were still learning the airplane as well. The, the the people we fought against, you know, it was their relatively early days, you know, on the F3. Yeah, I think you know, in subsequent years when I moved onto that aeroplane myself, we got better at teaching people combat. Oh, right, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, so, so in subsequent years, you know, in, in sort of the recent years, sort of 1990s onwards, we focused a lot more on air combat flying. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little bit like the old uh, American Navy and the Top Gun story of the 1960s in Vietnam. Yeah. You know, they didn't really teach uh, DACT. Um, and therefore the guys were poorly equipped to actually do visual manoeuvring. They then started Top Gun and started teaching people how to fight the aeroplane properly. And of course, it completely changes the dynamic, mm -hmm. you know, so, so you could get, you know, it, it, you know, it got a lot better in subsequent years, you know, with that complete change in focus. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the focus had very much been, you know, in the 60s and 70s and even the early 80s, you know, on intercepting rather than fighting, mm -hmm. but of course then, you know, for us in Europe, you know, MiG-29, well, in the, in the UK, when the MiG-29 came along, we went, well, it's never going to get here, you know, because it was such a short-range aeroplane. And then SU-27 came along, and that completely changed it. And yeah. went, ooh, actually, you know, now when we go off to intercept the bears over the North Sea, it's not, not just the bears yeah. that's now an issue. It's now potentially an SU-27, mm -hmm. you know, environment as well. Yeah. So we had to change our thinking. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah.